I'm going to give you a little background on what I've done up until now and then talk about my new project, which is all of Hopper's images of Joe. So um, this is in the process of hopefully becoming an exhibition. I have two venues that are interested um, and or publication. So it's, it's literally um, in its seminal stages, but it's very exciting work and I've had a lot of good feedback on it. But I thought I'd start with what I've done up until now. Some of you have um, heard me speak in the past, but I thought I'd give you a little background. These are the things that actually finally got published. So the discovery of artworks by Joe Hopper, that's the Women's Art Journal in 2004. And some of you may know, and I've spoken about this at various times over the years. In 2000, I did an ex exhibition at the Truro Historical Museum with Diane Shumway, who was the director at the time. And um, that was an exhibition of watercolors that had been discovered in the collection of Arthur Sanborn, who was a Hopper family friend. And in the 10 months that Joe lived after Ed died, she gave Arthur Sanborn all these magnificent watercolors for safekeeping as she was going blind. Um, I'd been a Hopper scholar for many years. I've been trying to find Joe's work, and all I kept hearing was, well, it's gone, there isn't any, the Whitney got rid of it, which is another story. They got rid of some, not all. But anyway, there was no uh, way of locating her work. I read accounts of it, but I was literally visiting Arthur Sanborn in Florida. We had corresponded on another project. And it was right after the Hopper watercolor show was at the Smithsonian. And this beautiful watercolor by Joe called Pink House from Charleston was hanging in the bedroom. And the house was filled with Hopper work. So I walked into the bedroom and I said, Pink House, Charleston, I've seen every watercolor by Ed. I've never seen this. And he said, that's not by Ed, it's by Joe. And I said, well, how can it be by Joe? I've been looking everywhere for Joe's work. And all I keep hearing is it's gone. He said, no, it's in the basement. And literally <laughs> came up with dozens of exquisite watercolors. Now, um, and I called Diane, that was February of 2000, I called Diane Shumway at the, at the Truro Museum. She'd been helping me with a number of different Hopper things. And she said, well, bring them up, let's do a little exhibit, which we did. So at that time, Arthur Sanborn donated um, Apple Tree, Lewis Farm, that two-sided oracle. So that led uh, back to the Whitney, to the storage rooms at the Whitney. And if you just keep asking politely enough, eventually people feel sorry for you. And they give you an art handler to go through all the uncatalogued watercolors. And 300 plus of Joe's watercolors turned up. Wow. So the Whitney had a lot when they got mm -hmm. the request. It hadn't all been processed. Museums get huge donations of work. How much staff time they can devote to processing it, conserving it, and accessioning it is complicated. And they had lots of Joe's work. There hadn't been a lot of interest in it. And so it hadn't been processed until I came along ended up cataloging all of it. But anyway, long story short, this article in the Women's Art Journal was about the discovery of the Sanborn pieces and the discovery of the work of the Whitney. Now, what ended up happening as a result of that, we're just going to segue into what I want to talk about tonight, is that suddenly we are now able to position <coughs> Joe next to Ed. Ed did not paint alone. Mm. For 40 years, Joe is sitting next to him. So this myth of solitary Ed, you know, the loner out there in the dunes. No, I'm going to show you pictures. They're literally next to each other. So. Um, again, what I've written, the unpublished book on the Hopper's Two Artist Marriage, which I've had nibbles, um, I'm actually going to get that published. But you can't, it's, it's like Pollock and Krasner. You, no one looks at Pollock anymore without looking at Lee Krasner. Well, when Joe's work didn't exist, and Sanborn also had lots of Joe's record books that no other scholars had seen, so I had access to those, and what I was able to do was reconstruct her exhibition life. She was showing with the top American modernists in New York. Her exhibition record was extremely <laughs> impressive. She had a better exhibition record in the 20s than George O'Keefe did. Now, of course, when you're married to a superstar, your information sort of disappears, but anyway. This was the rediscovery of Joe. This was um, in the attic of Upper's boyhood home in Nyack, and Arthur Sanborn um, inherited the contents of the attic in Nyack. He was a family friend from Nyack. He was the family minister. Um, I did an oral history with him at the Whitney before he passed away, and during the, um, the conversation when I was um, talking to him about his recollections, he started going on about the secret French girlfriend, and I said, what secret French girlfriend? And he said, well, there's a box of letters in the attic from the secret French girlfriend. So we went on and did other things, and then eventually he passed away, and everything that had been in Florida went to Boston. 
And I spoke with his son, and I said, who now has all the papers, and I said, let's find that box of letters from the secret French girlfriend. Anyway, that's what this is. My dear Mr. Hopper, this was published by the Whitney and Yale University Press a couple of years ago. Hi, guys. My daughter and son-in-law, who were in traffic on six. People were saying they also heard about traffic. We also heard there were numerous people who wanted to be here tonight and couldn't be because you can't park in Provincetown. Obviously, you were able to. But anyway, we're going to get these people home in time for the Republic. <laughs> so, uh, my dear Mr. Hopper was the discovery of the letters. Now, the same, what, what's happening here, that same story of the myth of Hopper being alone. These letters document a 10-year relationship with a woman he was pursuing in France. And um, again, he's writing home to his family and, oh, here I am all alone in France at the cafe and I'm all alone in France painting at the banks of the Seine and I'm all alone in France. And the letters, she's like, what time are you picking me up for dinner? So for 10 years, all three times he went to France saying, I'm going to France to learn about art. And she's in France saying, when are you coming? And he gets there and they're going to dinner and they're going out there. So this, this book documents that 10-year relationship. Again, um, a new side of Hopper we didn't know anything about. So um, that's what I was doing up until what I'm doing now. Now, before I move ahead to the new project, which is Mademoiselle Joe, which I'll explain in a minute. That's OK. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> My projection is. OK, I love giving these talks up here, because obviously we are in Hopper land. Um, this is my all-time favorite. This is a caricature. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these in a minute. But these are images, little little drawings that Hopper did. And I'm violating his privacy. He never intended that these be exhibited. He did them to communicate his deepest feelings with Joe. And I'll show you some in a few minutes. But, the mix. but my intent is a worthy one, so he'll forgive me. But isn't this charming? <laughs> it's so them. I mean, he's so tall. She's so short. She's looking up at him so lovingly. Anyway, they're going off to paint the South Truro Church, which, of course, was in Truro. And what it burned in 1940, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is Ed, who was not always kind to Joe. This is Joe painting the South Truro Church in the wind. Now, the wind has come, crashed her easel on her head. Um, the cat is here. The easel's falling apart. And here, this is Joe trying to paint in the wind. Um, this is his painting of the South Truro Church, and I took this just the other day. This is her painting of the South Truro Church, which, of course, is in the Truro Library, hung up very, very high. So that's why I took a picture like that. So this is all, you know, local, uh, local scenery. Next one. And, of course, this is the Methodist Church Tower, which is the building we're in. We all know we're in this building. Yes, that's the Methodist Church Tower. Now, one is by Ed and Worth probably close to a million, and one is by Joe, and has no value because her works have not sold recently. I've been working with a couple of dealers in New York because her work does turn up very Where is that, the, the Joe? Um, the jo oh, this one is yeah. the Whitney. This right. one is actually the Whitney. In fact, I was going to say, I purposely didn't put their names. Can you tell that's Ed and this mm -hmm. is her? She's yeah. not finished. Hers wasn't finished. Mm -hmm. His was. And of course, his is very valuable. But I'm going to show you some other examples in a few minutes. And, and whenever I show them, people are hard pressed to tell which is hers and which is his. And of course, if it's his, it's very valuable. The problem with hers is nothing's been sold since in, well, the 60s when she was alive. And even then, she wasn't selling a lot. So the last sales records were watercolors for $35. So how do you begin? Wow. What the Whitney does now, in fact, this went out on loan. Um, anything that goes out on loan, the base value is $5,000. So if, if something burned <coughs> or is lost, it's $5,000. But do, do, will it sell for that? I mean, that we don't know. OK, let's see what's next. OK, now we're starting to look at Mademoiselle Joe, um, which I'll explain in a minute the origin of this. But we're looking at Joe Hopper's role as model, fellow artist, wife, and muse, thoroughly studied for the first time through a comprehensive examination of his many drawn and painted images of her. And there are many. There are 60 drawings of the Whitney alone, drawings and watercolors of her various different times in their lives. And all of the studies, she posed for 29 of his major oils. So we're going to look at all of those as well. And again, most of these drawings and works on paper have never been exhibited. And they haven't been lined up with the oils. That was done with a few of the oils in the um, Whitney Hopper drawing show, mm -hmm. but not for all of them. I love this. This mm -hmm. was his Christmas card to her, dating from 1923. They were courting at the time. They married in 24. So this is his Christmas card to Joe. Um, and here they're sort of you know, cuddling in the window, looking out over Paris, the moonlight, Notre Dame in the distance. Complete fabrication. They were never in Paris together. This is sort of his romantic illusion. But it's very sweet. And this is a quote from a book of poetry he'd given her. But this is when they were. Um, Young and happy. <laughs> Go ahead, next one. OK, so the sources of inspiration for the exhibition. Uh, the Met did Madame Cezanne. This was last fall. Uh, Pace Gallery did Picasso Jacqueline. Go on to the next one. 
Uh, this was published in 2008, Hidden in the Shadow of the Master, the Model Wives of Cezanne, Monet, and Rodin. So the idea of looking at artists' wives has been around for a while. Um, obviously, in the case of Jo, the more and more I learned about her, um, you just can't write her out of the story anymore. As I said, it's like Pollock and Krasner. You know, she's absolutely <coughs> key to understanding, especially because so much of his work they painted, um, they were painting side by side. Now, uh, this was a, this woman, Ruth Butler, is Rodin's biography. And the same thing happens. She's doing the definitive biography of Rodin, and suddenly his wife keeps turning up, and they, the same thing, starting to tell the full story of Rodin, you can't take the wife out of the picture. She's absolutely key to our understanding. And that's the same premise. So the book was praised for the author's efforts to rescue from obscurity the women who were so much a part of the triumphs of these visionaries. That certainly applies to Hoffman. Next one. Um, now, we're going back and looking at his many representations. Now, I'm just showing you sort of smatterings. There are groupings. These are the early nudes. So I'm going to show you about six different groupings. And these would basically be um, galleries within the, uh, within the exhibition. So I'm showing you a variety of pieces. Incidentally, as I'm talking, if any questions, certainly stop me. I'm happy to answer. Um, so these are the early nudes, very sensual. Most of these have not been published. This one, um, I think, has that one a couple of times. Um, that's one of the other things that's exciting about doing the exhibition when I was talking to the Whitney curators about it. Um, it would literally be an opportunity to show more than 60 works on paper that they own. Stephen has joined us. Yes, dear. <laughs> so glad you made it. No, it's OK. Um, I'm talking about the early sensual nudes. Um, but if the if Whoever does the exhibition, the opportunity to look at 60 works on paper, more actually, uh, some in private collections, um, 60 works on paper that represent Joe in various different guises um, that have never been seen before. Maybe a handful of them have been published. So to take this whole body of work and look at them as individual objects in their own right, but also relating them to the oils, I mean, this just illuminates a whole aspect of Hopper's career and his working practices that we know nothing about. So the earliest representation was 1923, the Christmas card. And then now they're married. They married in 1924. And now he did these various um, representations of her nude. And some of them are quite erotic. I didn't include those. But there are probably a dozen altogether that really tell, a, um, tell the story of the intimacy, the sensuality and the intimacy. OK, let's see what else. Oh, he also inscribed them. That's the other thing. I'm looking at everything he ever inscribed to her. And that's interesting also. She was extremely possessive. One of the reasons that she was his sole model is he wouldn't, she wouldn't allow him to interact with other females in any capacity. He certainly, she certainly didn't want him in the presence of other women that were not clothed. Mm -hmm. So um, she assumed this role. She also had done some minor amateur acting. She envisioned herself as an actor, so she was happy to take on these roles. Now it's 1926 to 96, uh, or um, 66. This is 40 years. I found 40 years of oils that Joe posed for. Again, I'm showing you just a handful. But in the exhibition, or in the book, or both, there'll be 29 major oils by Hopper that she posed for, matched up with, with all the drawings. I'll show you a few of them tonight. So this is from the biography. These were both painted around the same time. He had a major exhibition in 27. Turned again to his in-house model and actress, posing Joe seated in an armchair nude, gazing out the window, dressed in a hat and coat, pensively nursing a cup of coffee. Now, what's interesting, in this case, we don't have these drawings. We have Joe's accounts of having um, posed for him. That was the first thing I had to do, was find her um, verbal descriptions of all the things she posed for, and then try to track down the drawings. Now, these I have not found. I know that the drawings exist, whether or not they're in private collections. The Whitney doesn't have them, but that's one of the things I'm working on. OK, let's see the next one. Now, New York movie. We, there must be 30 studies for New York movie. The Whitney has all of them. This painting um, was largely represented in the Hopper Drawing Show, because there were so many drawings. Um, so here in her diary, she wrote that she posed for two moviegoers, black hat with veil and fur coat. And I'll we'll show you those in a minute. So she's posing for the people in the audience and also um, posing for the usherette. She's standing in a cold hallway outside their apartment. Now, what's very interesting about these as we move along, and I have to check my notes, is Joe's age. Now, when they got married, she was 40. Um, as we move along, there are some views of her um, let's see, New York movie, she's 57. 
And there's one of her sort of this, well, the girly show is a stripper. I think she was 63. Oh. So one of the things, and she was probably pretty taut. But there's one at which Hopper, one of the latest ones he did, um, nude, what was it, um, uh, nude in the sun, and she was 77. And he, he wrote to someone, oh, that's Joe glorified by art. <laughs> so the woman does not look 67, so or 77, excuse me. So um, again, her role as model, costume designer, I mean, she, she acquired the, um, the, the props or the, the garments. Now what's really interesting about this, go to the next one, please. I don't know if I put them all in. So these are some of the studies. These are the studies of the, um, the people who were sitting in the audience. Carter Foster had this um, at the inside, uh, first picture you saw on the inside of the exhibition catalog. And he went on about how much he loved this drawing. Because the figure is smiling. You so rarely see this in Hopper. Mm -hmm. Just that little, little sort of hint of a, hint of a, of a grin. It's just, it's just a really sort of profound sense of, of her as a person, which is something that um, often doesn't come through. There's usually the imagery is much more um, impersonal. Let's see the next ones. Yeah, I didn't put all the other ones in. This is the girly show. For the um, for New York movie, he did five different styles of shoes. And I'm thinking, why would he be doing all these different shoes? He ended up with like a T-strap, but there were you know pumps and some heels were hollow. It was just interesting. As Carter said, the whole reason for having done the drawing show was to look at his process and to look at how he made any number of different changes. He changed the proportions of the room. He changed the placement of the furniture. He changed you know, the view out the window. In this case, we're narrowing it down to specifically look and see how he changed the figure. And in this case, the figure was his wife. So it brings mm -hmm. in all this additional information. Now, this is the girly show. Um, she's 59, 59. Um, this, I laughed out loud. On Valentine's Day, he went to a burlesque show. Now, alone. So we kind of knew there were maybe some issues in the marriage, you know. But I'm like, did that maybe not send off, set off a bell, whatever. Um, two days later, he asked her to pose. Two days later, she found him drawing strippers. And then uh, he, he asked her to pose. And so she did. So it was freezing cold and drafty. She had to be nude. The only heat they had in the apartment, this is in New York, was the coal stove. So she had to huddle next to this coal stove, shivering and freezing, and got burned, burned, and then, again, this is from the biography, lodged no complaints. So this is poor Joe, suffering and freezing and shivering. Um, this is actually the first painting I started looking at. My research started with uh, Hopper's Images of Women when I was a graduate student many years ago, and there was a Hopper retrospective at the Whitney in the mid-70s or late-70s, and I went to the exhibit and I'm looking around at, you know, lighthouses, all the other things we associate with Hopper, and then I saw this and I was like, yikes, what was that about, where did it come from? And then found out his wife posed for it, and then it got very much more interesting after that, but that's another story. So this is the study of Joe, this is the study of Joe. So again, to look at the transformation, obviously the body type changes, and the whole, the whole demeanor of the figure also, there's lots to look at here. In fact, I should stay at this point, and I've done this in the past when I first uh, discussed Joe's work after we discovered it, and I gave a little talk up at Truro. This is works in process. In other words, we're lining all these things up and starting to look at them. I have some ideas about how the drawings are transformed, but this is not in any way conclusive, which is what makes it exciting and fun for me at this point. Let's see the next one. Um, okay, this is Morning in a City, and uh, this was in a recent um, Whitney exhibition, and I'm on the audio guide. I think it's on the, on the website. And um, in the audio guide, they, they interview you for like two hours. They put the paintings in front of you and say, just talk about the painting. And what I talked about was the, the placement of the drape here. In the, um, in the study, the drape comes down to the middle of her thigh. Here, it's raised to the breast. So the breasts are almost exposed. And in this one, the drape is raised to the point where it almost exposes her pubic area. But the breasts are more covered. So I went on and on and on. And don't they keep like the 20 second clip where I'm talking about the pubic area? And people called me. I was like, oh dear, you know. So, um, and I said, can't you just contextualize that a little bit more? And they said, well, it's important. Whoever's looking in can see your pubic area. Whatever. So if you, and they used it in Boston also. When you do an audio guide for one museum, then you sign off and that means other people can use it. So I'll never look that down. But A Woman in the Sun, I think I'm also on the audio guide for that. I have, I think, more eloquent things to say. But this will be something else to look at how she's transformed. Oh, one of the things I've looked at in great detail 
is the furniture. Look at the size of the bed. All the furniture is too small. Can that woman fit in that bed? Not a chance. Now, Hopper was 6'5 at the age of 12. And Joe wrote about when he finally was selling enough paintings for them to make enough money to have a bed custom made because he always slept in the fetal position. So, um, but all the furniture, when you look at it, the windows are too big and the furniture is often too small. This is a good example. You don't notice it. It's kind of a subliminal. Let's see the next one. Okay, this is Morning Sun. <laughs> when the Hopper Drawing Show was in um, Dallas, I went down to give a talk, and this was a billboard. Literally, the plane is landing. <laughs> this is a billboard in Texas. Everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, Hopper, Hopper. That was what they knew. Now, at this point, Joe is um, 70. This is Joe at 70. What's unusual about this is he keeps, um, this is the one where he keeps her appearance. This is closest to what she actually looked like. But just recently, um, someone came to the Whitney who was doing her dissertation uh, in psychology, a doctoral dissertation, and she was incorporating Hopper into sort of therapeutic practices. And she pointed out to me, and I've never noticed this before, what in heaven's name has happened with that hand? Now, where's the arm? <laughs> and when you look in the drawings, and he knew how to draw hands. He knew human anatomy. So when you look at the drawings, the arm is there and the hand is there. And here's the arm. Now here the hand's getting a little weird. The hand's getting a little bit claw-like. But isn't that sort of awful? Mm -hmm. And I never really noticed it. It's red and it's gnarled and it's mm -hmm. very disturbing. Very disturbing. In fact, we pulled out, she came to the, to the Whitney Library where I'm uh, the research associate. And I pulled out as many reproductions as we could find. And the color is really correct. In other words, the hand is that color. So it's so disturbing. Who knows what's going on with that? Mm -hmm. But it's very peculiar. And here, again, the, the, the arm, what's really odd, too, is he was a master at that. He often eliminated anything he considered so superfluous detail. In this case, it's a limb. And you, you kind of need the limb attached to the hand. Otherwise, it just gets very strange. OK, let's see the next one. Uh, this is excursion into philosophy. Now, at this point, uh, this was painted in Truro. Joe is 77, okay? Now, he had gone through a dark period. He hadn't been able to work, and he finally um, was able to do painting. I think it was the first one that year. Has me stretched out and back with not a stitch on. She decided the open book was played over and read too late. Um, I call these the sexual trauma paintings, and there are several of them. He had undergone several hernia and prostate surgeries at the time. I wrote about that at length in the book. Also, look at that bed. Is the bed made of cement? Is that bed made of cement? Is that a comfortable bed? No. It's totally made out of stone. I mean, it doesn't, you know, the, the body doesn't even make a slight indentation. And um, there's nothing about it that's cozy or warm or sensual or welcoming in any possible way. And again, the, um, the figures don't really fit onto the, uh, onto the furniture. It's, it's uncomfortable on so many levels. The windowsills are always way too low also. Portions of the architecture are, uh, are way off. But again, that's Joe. Um, let's see now. Woman in the Sun. Now, uh, this is the Whitney owns this. This is their sort of masterwork oil. Um, and again, that's Hopper saying Joe glorified by art. She was 79. She was 79 when this was painted. And this is um, one of the studies. There are two studies. This one's in, um, in private hands. And um, again, he changed the position. Same thing with the bed. The bed there, it's interesting, in one of the sketches, I didn't include it, but one of the sketches, the bed is a more normal size, like it comes out here, so it looks as if the figure could actually fit into it, but then he keeps making it smaller. Also, what's with the shoes? He does lots of paintings of nude women, and the only thing you see in the room are shoes. <laughs> so, who knows? But, you know, they're interesting. A professor of mine said to me years ago, it's, you don't always have to have the answers to the questions, but simply posing the question gives you a new way of looking at it. So those are all the studies, or a handful. Again, there are 29 oils that Joe posed for, and those, the ones that I showed you roughly span that 40-year period. Let's see what's next. Okay, so these are uh, a subcategory of works of Joe sketching and painting, and there are probably two dozen of these, and this time period is about, uh, about 20 years. Um, there are more later, but this during this 1924 to 46 period is when he did most of them. And this again, Joe sketching, this is the earliest one, 23, 24. This is around the time that they were married or shortly before they were married. And that's in um, Gloucester. This is Joe sketching in the Truro House. Now I'm going to talk in a minute about, again, that painting together theme. But he's painting her painting. So um, they, they are obviously engaged in um, 
uh, the same creative activity. This is a gem, Whitney owns this. Let's see the next one. Oh, it's interesting too, he doesn't show her face. Now this is the only oil he ever did of her painting, and she loved this painting. Um, he exhibited it and then later, later gave it to her as a, as a wedding gift. But many people pointed out, and you may know, but I'll sort of sum up, in the Hopper marriage, one of the major sources of distress and dismay for Joe is that he didn't do enough to help support her or promote her as an artist. And you may know that the backstory is that he hadn't sold a painting in 10 years. She was exhibiting all over New York, had a very successful career as an exhibiting artist, primarily watercolors. And they started keeping company in Gloucester in the summer of 1923. Um, he, again, hadn't sold anything in, in 10 years. He was making a living as a commercial artist, which he hated doing. And um, they go back to New York, and she was at a big watercolor show at the Brooklyn Museum. She went to the curators and said, oh, in fact, one version I've heard is she gave him some of her wall space. Each of the artists had been given a certain amount of space. So they talked, she talked them into taking some of his watercolors. He also hadn't painted watercolors before he spent time with her. So she sort of got him started painting watercolors and then um, included the work in the Brooklyn Museum exhibition. They bought one of his watercolors. Frank Wren came and saw the watercolors, um, took him on as an artist, represented him for the rest of his life, and basically his career skyrocketed from that day forward. Now, Joe took... What year was that? 24. Okay. 24. So, um, and then Joe continued with her own work, but she also assumed the sort of caretaker role with Ed at the same time. But the, one of the major threads, it certainly is true in the biography throughout the years of marriage, is this deep resentment she felt that he didn't do enough to help promote her work. And um, it's interesting, one argument I've heard, you may know this, but Hopper was excruciatingly shy you know, very limited interaction. In fact, one of the premises behind the exhibition is that this is the most emotionally charged relationship, certainly the most intimate, the closest relationship he had with a human being, happened to be Joe. And that's another reason to sort of look at this, sort of plummet to see how it, how it relates to, to all the art. But um, he didn't have many close relationships. And, um, well, in this case, so he didn't have many close relationships. He wasn't, he didn't promote his own work. He wasn't going around to galleries saying, you should show my work. People discovered him. And he would not have been likely to help promote Joe's work. But when people came to the gallery or to the studio to look at his work, she could have shown hers. Um, anyway, he finally does an oil of Joe painting. There's no easel. There are no brushes. There's no paint. <laughs> so he calls it Joe painting. Now, if we didn't know that, she could be sewing. She could be gardening. But she, there's nothing here to tell us that she's an artist painting. Most paintings of painters painting, you see, you put the paint. So this is the major oil that he did of her, and she's not painting. Let's see. But, she's, but she's focused on something. She is. She is. And exactly. her arm is. is yeah. Yeah, and she the line probably is exactly. Yeah. It prob I'm, I'm sure she is painting. It's yeah. just couldn't he have sort of panned out? Yeah. He did do watercolors. We're going to see some watercolors of her painting. But his major oil of Joe painting, we don't see any of the painting. Okay. Now he did a series of. Um, studies of Joe reading, sleeping, and sewing. And these are absolutely beautiful. This is Joe sleeping, obviously in comfortable covers, and this is Joe sewing, reading. There, there are probably three dozen of these at the Whitney. And again, I sort of made them into a subcategory. Now, again, going back to Madame Cezanne at the Metropolitan, when I looked at all the representations of Madame Cezanne, this is a direct quote talking about Cezanne's wife. He casually sketched her sleeping or sewing. They glimpse a tender interchange informal, unguarded moments, exposing an intimacy rarely seen with the oils. Now that's Dia Amory, who was the curator of the Madame Cezanne exhibition, but I read that and I thought, wait a minute, that's absolutely what's happening in all these drawings, which again haven't, um, haven't been shown. And the amount of care he put into this, this is an exquisitely rendered drawing. This is hours spent um, representing Joe in these, these very tender moments. Also, obviously, they were great readers, and he has, has images of Joe reading spanning many decades. Let's see the next one. Now we get to the caricatures. <laughs> now these are so not flattering. Um, the caricatures, there are probably, there are probably 36 of them. There are two private collections, and um, I Few of them have been published over the years. He literally said, in fact, Brian O'Doherty, who, who interviewed the Hopper shortly before they died, and he went to see them in the Toro studio, and he said, Joe brought out this, this folder and said, oh, you should see these. Um, Eddie give, gives these to me when he doesn't want to talk to me. 
he puts the drawing down and walks out of the room. So um, there are lots of them. Loosely dated 1930 to 1955, some of them are dated. So um, he shows her in a variety of different guises. I've described these as, as evidence of the marital battlefield that was the Hoppers' relationship. Joe did not like to cook. So this is Joe as the negligent wife. Mealtime is emaciated man begging for food, and his wife is up in the clouds reading a book. She adored her cat Arthur far more than she cared about him. Um, here Arthur is dining at the table with this lavish meal, and here Ed is is on the ground emaciated begging for a crumb. You know. Now I'm looking at this and I'm like, make a sandwich. You know, I mean, really. This is clearly though, to his way of thinking, you know, the wife was supposed to provide nourishment. In fact, um, the um, we we're talking about Lewis Farm. There's this story about um, the apple trees at Lewis Farm, and supposedly, you know, she baked a pie and she wrote about making these apple pies. And um, it was Gerard Stevens was saying to me, you know, everyone knew she hated cooking. She screamed and yelled about how much she didn't want to cook. She wouldn't be a kitchen slave. And he argued the chances of her ever having made a pot. Who knows? But obviously, Ed felt she was not nurturing him. Um, now, the non anger man and the pro anger woman, you know, he's angelic, of course, with the halo, and she's the scrappy little so and so. And there are, there are numerous. Um, representations where he shows her sort of scolding and screaming out. But I think it was Brian O'Doherty said, you know, there are different ways of looking at this. He was known to be depressive or depressed and, and that Joe somehow stung him to life, you know, that she got fired up and got him moving again when people would describe these long periods when he wasn't able to work. But anyway, she's the pro-anger woman, you know, scratching. And then this is Shea Hopper, the eternal argument. We've got the two, two chickens screaming at each other, you know, just, just <laughs> carrying on. So this is, is what the relationship was about, or part of it. And again, there are many more of these. This is one of the most brutal. Josie stomping on Ed's head. Now, she's wearing a shoe with nails. It's kind of like cleats, if you, if you saw this up close. Now, here's poor bald Ed, you know, fetal position on the floor. And, you know, Joe's like this stomping. Now, who knows what happened? Now, the, uh, there are others where he appears to, to win the battle, but most of the time he feels that Joe does. But this says a lot about the marriage. So, we're, again, if I'm going to look at every representation that he did of Joe, we have to certainly consider these. And again, they, they tell sort of the emotional backstory of the relationship. And then all of this ultimately is related to the oils. You know, we have these magnificent masterworks that are revered by many, and they're always described as being so mysterious. Well, when you start piecing together what was going on in his personal life, it sort of helps us to understand some of the, uh, the mystery. Let's see the next one. And again, this is painting together. I just love this. In fact, this I wanted to use as the cover of the story of the two artists' marriage. Um, about a month after he died, she wrote to uh, someone about how difficult life was without him. And again, she died about 10 months after he did. And she described their relationship as perfection of its own snappy kind. So that's Joe. Mm -hmm. But this is so cute. I mean, she's got her socks down around her ankles. And, and this is everything he described about her, and he did other drawings of her. But she's looking up at him so adoringly. And, you know, Eddie would carry my paints, and Eddie would carry my easel going off together, but that's absolutely, and that's his, um, his outfit, his little uniform that he wore when he went. Let's see the next one. Okay, here they are painting together. Now these are, a lot of these are watercolors, some turned up at the Whitney, um, Sanborn had the others. Works by Joe, so that we can now situate her next to, um, next to Ed. And I said, if we're going to look at the relationship and look at how she's depicted in his work, uh, we have to bring her work. It has to now become part of, part of that dialogue. Up until now, that hasn't been done. No one has positioned her work next to his. I mean, I did it when I published, but they have to put it next to each other. All right, so now they're painting together. This is Joe in Wyoming painting Mount Moran, and this is Mount Moran. The, the Whitney owns the watercolor. So this, and actually she did three of these. Sanborn owns two, the Whitney owns one. So Joe in Wyoming also records the Hopper's practice of using the car as a studio with Petite Joe painting Mount Moran. She was barely five feet, so they pushed the seat up, and she painted in the front seat, 
and lanky Ed, I guess his knees touching the ceiling, but he painted the back seat. In fact, right at the corner of center here, isn't Rooms for Tourists the inn at the corner? I'm thinking right at Bradford and Center. That's the inn. The center inn is Rooms for Tourists. And I think when Nick Robbins was here, he talked about that painting being done. Nick Robbins was the, one of the curators of the drawing show through the car window, that he was looking through the car window. So um, this idea of them using, in fact, the Methodist church towers also, it was a rainy day, and Joe wrote about painting from the car. So um, again, they used, they used, and they were big old, old Buicks. They used them as the studio. But again, this is him painting, Joe painting. Let's see the next one. And now here they are side by side. Now these are, are watercolors that turned up in the, um, in the Sandboard collection. One of my other premises that I hope to explore if I'm able to do this in greater detail is her influence on him, which is very significant. Um, she was a very bright colorist. Um, some of the things that turned up in the Whitney the Reginald Marsh bequest came to the Whitney as well as the Hopper, and Felicia Meyer Marsh, who was married to Reginald Marsh, was a good friend of Joe's, and a whole batch of oils. In fact, the cover of the Woman's Original article of um, edition that had my article had one of the these <coughs> oils that turned up in the Marsh bequest. But they show what Joe's work looked like before she met Ed, and she was a brilliant colorist. She had all these bright, full of colors. She was very connected to what was going on in Paris at the time. And so as they're working together, his palette definitely changes. Now this is his oil of Cornhill, but in his watercolor of Cornhill, I mean this is Jo, I call them her flourishes. She loved fuchsia and this fuchsia pink and purple and she has all these wonderful things happening in the color. Well he basically is earth toned. You'll see that in a few other examples. But it's all about these sort of dark earthy colors. But his palette gradually starts to lighten and he starts to do more with bright color. But they're, they're literally, again, painting side by side. You can't discount the, um, the uh, possibility, and I think it's more than that, that she was influencing what he was doing. It's certainly part of the story that we at least have to look at. Let's see the next one. Yeah, Railroad Gates and Gloucester. Now, this is funny. This is 1928. So he'd been painting watercolor at this point for four years. But it's funny because he handles the paint very thickly. She's doing these loose fluid washes, which are much more in keeping with the modernist watercolor techniques. This is the way people like John Marin were painting at the time. So she's really connected with the modernists, especially in terms of the bright colors. This is very much what the, the modern painters were doing, whereas Hopper is still sort of earthbound. You wouldn't even really know this is a watercolor. It doesn't have the kind of translucent washes. It's based. He paints thick, it's almost a gouache, where it's a, a thicker, denser paint. It's also so much their personalities. I mean, she's filled with, you know, peaches. Look, she's outlining the, the houses in purple, and she's got salmon and green and all these lively colors, and it's always brown. Not that we don't like it, but it's always brown. Let's see the next one. <laughs> now here, look at this Gloucester roofs. They're absolutely next to each other. When I saw this, this um, Sanborn brought this up from the basement, and this was right after the, uh, Hopper Watercolor Show had been in Washington at the uh, Smithsonian, the National Museum of American Art, and I knew this really well. I was like, and I saw this, and I was like, wait a minute, that's the railing. And you know, look at this. This is, you know, they're absolutely next to each other. She also, because she was five feet tall, she painted vertically, and of course he's six five, and he painted horizontally, <laughs> wanted to be closer to the earth than she wanted to be. But, but when you look at this, it's, I've written a lot about the personalities, again, the way in which their characters or their temperaments or their worldviews really come through with the work. But she's got all these sort of luminous colors. I mean, this is beautiful. It's, it's beautifully crafted, but it, um, it doesn't have that same sort of um, lyrical quality to it. Let's see the next one. Now, these are the, the Dauphiné house, Captain Kelly's house, which, of course, is nearby. Who did which? What do you think? Which is Ed's and which is Joe's? <laughs> what do you think? I always ask this. I can't resist. What do you think? Which one do you think is a better painting? The left. The one on the one on the left is a better painting. Yeah. Okay. Why do you think it's a better painting? It's less fussy. It's more less pure. fussy. Oh, that's good. That's excellent. Okay, that's good. It's so funny because again, if they were on on the block at Sotheby's <coughs> or Christie's, we'd be talking millions, millions versus. I don't think so. We're not even going to take it for sale. Okay, one on the left is better because it's less fussy. Anyone get one more? <laughs> I'm no artist. No, I'm no, specialist. it's a very good observation, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But I don't want to give it away. Anyone else have an opinion on which one could be by whom and why? I think or which one you prefer? I think the Ed Ed Hopper is the right one. No. Oh, okay. Why do you level. think the Ed Hopper is the right one? I think the coloring is more like his. Yeah, and it is. It's more um, modeled. 
Yes, that's absolutely true. The paint handling is much closer yeah. to the way he actually painted. Anyone else have an opinion, one way or the other? Or which one you think is a better paint? I think the right hand one is Joe because the palette is much brighter. Yeah, many more Joe. colors. One of the right is Joe. Oh, yeah. 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 That's Joe, and this is it. But, but what's interesting though is I don't you love she added the water. You know, she added the water, which gives you a much vaster you know sense of space. He's always sort of closed down and narrow, and and he um, and also the windows. I mean, this just looks desolate. There are no signs of life here at all. <laughs> 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 which, is, which is it? You know, that's that's just it. That's it. This is what I mean when you and I've done this where I've given lectures just on mm -hmm. let's figure out their personalities. I've done it with college students, and they have a field day with this because you've got orange and blue and green and you know it is fussy. There's all this going on, but it's also the sunlight and the trees and she's looking at texture. Yes, you you describe his work as being closed down and narrow, and that's, uh, that sounds to me mm -hmm. very negative. Well, you know... I mean, are there not other words that would yes. clearly describe that? The, the closed down and narrow part of it, what, what that means, and I don't mean it to be pejorative, but it's sort no, of true. I, uh, sorry. I, I, no, I'm no, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. He eliminated non-essential elements. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. that's one of the things he always did. Like, what is it? Sun in an empty room? Is it room by the sea? Yeah, it's sort of pure. Pure, exactly. They're very pure. But he's done paintings of empty rooms that originally had people in them. And he took the people out, you just end up with an empty room. He's done landscapes where you had telephone poles, and he took out all the telephone poles. And he took out all the cars. And he took out any signs of the people. When you look at the houses, um, most of the houses, well, this one didn't have one. But most of the houses don't have a path leading up to the house. There's no sort of way to get in. So he does lots of things where, in fact, Guy Dubois, I have to think of the word he used, Guy Dubois was his best friend. And when Hopper first started showing his oils, no one was interested, no one was buying them. And Guy, there's a famous quote from Guy Dubois, who was his best friend, who was trying to help promote his work. Guy got some of his things published, and, and he was really trying to help, help um, Hopper get, get going. And nothing was selling. And Guy said something about, it is so unfortunate, that's the word he used, literally bold. He said, it's so unfortunate that the work is so bald, it's so empty, it's so stripped, and that's why people don't like it. It's barren. That was the word that was always used. It's barren, it's cold, it's empty, it's desolate, all of that. Those are always the adjectives that are used. Now we embrace that. We mm -hmm. accept it that that's yeah, part so of it. But in those like days, it. it's like, Certainly. why would I want this in my house? You know, yeah. These are like ugly old buildings, and the room is dark and lonely. Yes? <laughs> I was noticing that the houses are almost in the same position, but the railroad tracks are different. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, they were sitting next to each other. They were up on the hill. So you know, I tried to go up the hill. They were up on the hill looking down at the house here. At the time, the railroad tracks were there. Yeah. But yes, Joe, um, they literally were sitting next to each other. But Joe often did that, more, even more so than Ed. She just changed. She just changed stuff around. Yeah. Yeah. She just changed stuff around because she, she <coughs> just felt like changing it around. She might have wanted to include more of this. Now, again, it's a great point. And I actually did try to get up the hill, but it's all covered with brush. And of course, the tracks aren't there. But he also um, may have intentionally made it a straighter line, because all his work is very geometric. He had a strong influence on abstract artists because of that, because the work is so geometric. So she may have intentionally done the diagonal. Anytime you have a diagonal, it just breaks up the composition and sort of makes it livelier. And it also gives you a way to get into the composition, much more so than, than a straight horizontal does. So there are a variety of those uh, things going on. But she also did a lot more of the brushwork is looser. But again, this is in keeping with what other modern painters were doing. Joe was looking at what the other painters were doing at the time. So he, Ed wasn't. I mean, Ed was just always going to paint the way that they painted. Whereas in Joe's case, she brings so much more to it. I just love the water. I just feel like it's so expansive. It opens out to the world, which is what Joe did. Joe had this very extroverted personality. And she was very open to the world, whereas Ed was, was much more so closed down. But I didn't mean that to mm -hmm. say that it was pejorative. But it is, it is yeah, empty. True. It's yeah. empty and barren. Which, and it's actually, at the time, the house was empty. I don't think anyone was living there. Let's see the next one. So they're, they're, oh, OK, now we're going to the Whitney. Um, I, uh, I guess in the course of conversation, we thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about um, Hopper at the New Whitney. Go to the new Whitney. It's wonderful if you have a chance when you're in New York. And I have to say, I, I worked in the Whitney Library for 15 years, and there was all this talk about we're going to expand the library or expand, expand the museum on the Upper East Side. And they couldn't do it. The neighborhood wasn't large enough to accommodate it. 
So when they decided to go down to the meatpacking district, this is just below 14th Street, and they came out with the models and the designs, and everybody shook their head five years ago, like, why would you go there? This just seems like a bad idea. It was a really smart idea. The museum is extraordinary, though without exception, if you read all the reviews, everyone pretty much acknowledges that the exterior of the building has absolutely no charm. It looks big and industrial and sort of unwelcoming. Um, but who was it? Jerry Saltz, I think, in New York Magazine said, the minute you walk in, all is forgiven. The interior spaces are exceptional. If you do go, this is the High Line. If you get on the High Line around 10th and 16th Street, um, or 18th, and walk down, the High Line ends at the Whitney. It's down the stairs, and the museum awaits you. Now, what's really great is you can see these terraces. These are terraces that come off the back of the new museum. And as you're walking down the High Line, you see these little sort of ants up here. And you're thinking, wow, that's amazing. And then you eventually climb up and look out at these terraces. The, the views <coughs> from the terraces are panoramic. They're exquisite. You can go around the side, see down to the, um, to the Statue of Liberty, see all the piers going up the Hudson River. Right next to where the Whitney is is the pier, where is it the Lusitania came in with the, um, oh no, the Carpathia landed with the people who survived from the Titanic. Uh, but it's absolutely beautiful, panoramic views of the river and um, the exterior. Also, the galleries are all through. They're open floors, so there's, there's glass at either end with these magnificent views. Also, these are sculpture displays. This is filled with sculpture by David Smith. I mean, the collection is, they've never been able to show as uh, much of the collection as they're showing. And again, this is a close-up view. Everyone loves the pink. It turns out it's a temporary work of art. Mm. I've been there like 12 times, and someone said the other day, you know, that's coming down. And we're like, no. Mm. That has to be part of the design, because it's just boring and industrial. Where's that piece of pink? So they're lobbying to keep it. Uh, but again, this is another view of these terraces coming out. It's, there are three of them. Off the, so you're in the gallery, you're looking at magnificent abstract expressionist works. and. Lots of magnificent things. It's eight floors. And then you can come down the um, outside through these wonderful terraces and then go back on the other side. It's wonderful. So let's look at Hopper at the, the Whitney. Oh, this is the Whitney entrance on the corner of West and Gansevoort Streets. And this is the meatpacking district, um, the last meatpacking plant where meat is actually processed. Um, is literally next to the Whitney. It shares a wall. This wall is the Whitney. The other wall next to it is meatpacking. In fact, if you walk down West Street, I did it once just for the experience, you walk past about eight loading docks where I don't eat meat, haven't for years, but the loading docks, they're unloading the trucks with the you know, animal remnants. So literally, the Whitney shares the wall with the last meatpacking plant. And eventually, when it goes, the Whitney will take it. OK, so this is the lobby, the entrance as you're coming in. And this is the lobby bookstore. So you're looking into the window of the lobby bookstore. Go to the next picture. For <laughs> sale in the lobby Yay. bookstore. <laughs> All my, my students were like, your book is there. Your book is there. Yes, that's very exciting. So there's my book in the bookstore. OK, now Edward Hopper at the New Whitney Museum of American Art. On the first floor, they have a gallery entitled 8 West 8th, which was the original address of the first Whitney, founded, of course, by Gertrude. Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. This is a wonderful painting. She was such a, a great feisty gal. 1918, she was married to Harry Payne Whitney. Um, Robert Henry was a very prominent artist at the time who painted this wonderful portrait of her wearing pants. Her husband refused to allow the painting to be hung in their home because she was wearing pants. So um, this is the famous painting of Gertrude. This is uh, shown at the Whitney Hall. It's a wonderful painting of her, and again, to wear pants in those days was entirely unacceptable. This is early Sunday morning, which is one of their iconic images. About two weeks ago, um, Adam Weinberg, who's the director of the museum and a former, well, he's still a Hopper scholar, but when he was at the Whitney years ago, he was a Hopper scholar. So he gave a talk about this and went on at length about the fact that the barber pole is a self-portrait. Um, I've looked at this so many times. <laughs> the barber pole is way too tall. He said, if you look at barber poles in front of buildings, they're not this tall. So the barber pole is way too tall, and it's bald. He said, this is totally hopper. I'm not. He's right. And then he started going on about the protagonist. 
the, 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 the hydrant is the protagonist. And then afterwards, he came up to me. We were talking, and I said, "You know who the protagonist is? Right. You know, this Just is absolutely Joe. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe is this little little stumpy, you know. So now I can't look at this without seeing this relationship between the barber pole and the and the uh, the fire hydrant." Um, but again, he took he took liberties with this. One of the things that Carter Foster discovered when he did the drawing show, if I were to put Nighthawks, Hopper's famous painting of the people in the diner, next to this, Nighthawks and early Sunday mornings share these rows of windows. Mm -hmm. And it's Greenwich Avenue in the village. Carter went back and found the historic photographs, and we now know exactly where this was situated. However, the sun is completely wrong. It's either <laughs> north, south, east, or west. This is entirely invented. So this, the storefronts were there, but the, um, he totally invented the lighting situation. So that is not what you would see in that actual place. But now we do know Barbara Paul is a self-portrait. Okay, let's see. <laughs> now, in this 8 West 8th um, gallery, which is devoted to the early days of the, um, the Whitney, uh, they have all these Hopper drawings. These are Hopper figure drawings. Now, the Whitney has almost 3,000 drawings by Hopper that they um, received with the request. Many of them are very early, but more than 1,000 are um, studies that he did when he was at the studio club. And again, this is also where some of the studies of Joe are part of the same, uh, the same collection. So these are his figure studies from the Whitney Studio Club life drawing classes around 1918. Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, who was obviously an artist herself, um, when she started the studio club, she wanted to help fellow artists. So they paid 20 cents to come in and have a three-hour class drawing from a nude model, which was cheaper than what anyone else charged. So these are um, some of Hopper's studies. Now I'm going to show you this. Let's see the detail. This is uh, Mabel Dwight. There were many women in these figure drawing classes. In fact, Joe took them. There was some thought that they might have gotten to know each other, or they knew each other peripherally at... Um, at the studio club classes. So this is Mabel Dwight. That's it. This is a caricature, but that's Ed in the life drawing class. <laughs> and um, here are some of, some of the nudes he was drawing at the time. These are various different other um, modern artists. I think that's John Sloan. That's John Sloan, and there's Ed the uh, class. So, but the opportunity to see that many of the drawings <coughs> together is quite special. Okay, let's see. Now, this is the context within which Hopper's works are presented. The exhibition that the new Whitney has started with, or has um, begun the, what will be their history in the new building, um, is based on what they call chapters. So they put together, the curators all worked on this. They selected bodies of work, um, situated them together, and chose the title of one of the paintings in the grouping called it a chapter, and then explained how and why the artists within that grouping belong where they do. And um, I'm not the only one who totally disagrees with what they did with Hopper. So this is um, Railroad Sunset from 1929. You will find Railroad Sunset displayed in a gallery called Breaking the Prairie. And this is the museum label text that you'll see. And um, I know Carter Foster very well. He's the um, one of the Hopper curators there now, and Barbara Haskell. And they were not directly involved with this. But the, um, to say that Railroad Sunset in some way or another is related to Frederick Edwin Church's um, portraits or his landscapes of, um, of sunsets in the, um, in the 1900s or the 1800s is just false. Hopper had absolutely no relationship with landscape painters. So what they're doing here is trying to establish that connection. Um, the idea that Hopper and his contemporaries picked up on the thread becoming deeply interested in America, both as a real place as an abstract idea, yes. But Hopper would be very distressed to find his work hanging in a gallery um, with the other regionalists. The other artists who hang in this gallery are Thomas Hart Benton, John Stuart Curry, um, and they were artists who in some way or another dealt with the prairie, the regionalist idea of, um, of looking at the Midwest. And Hopper was sometimes lumped with them because he did do realist portrayals of small towns but he in no way associated with what they were doing. So anyway, if you go to see the painting, that's where you'll find it. I think this is the influence of Joe. This painting was done again five years after they were married. He never used a palette like this, and these are totally Joe's colors. If you look at some of her oils and watercolors in the period, she was painting with this very sort of fiery palette. So I think that's, uh, that's clearly an influence here. And also they were taking a lot of train, train um, trips at the time, and that's obviously the you know, source of the imagery. Though again, it wasn't a specific place. Okay, let's see the next one. And this again is their type style as well. Now Rose Castle, 
these paintings are hung in a room with a painting, or it's actually a construction by Joseph Cornell. And it's all about surrealism. Now, a new way of looking at Hopper is trying to connect his work to a group of artists called the Magic Realists. 30s and 40s, American artists explore the connections between the real and the imagined, familiar, unsettling, strange, influenced by surrealism, movement in Paris in the 1920s. Hopper had nothing to do with surrealism. He wasn't even remotely interested in what they were doing. But um, I think what I really take issue with is the Hopper tweaked <coughs> the conventions of realism, turning the everyday into something psychologically charged. Yes. Sinister? No. I don't see cynicism, or I don't see anything sinister in, in, Hopper's, uh, in Hopper's realism. But anyway, it's, it's an interesting way of recontextualizing. In fact, what they've done in this room, it's interesting, because these two paintings are hanging at the, edge of the, at the end of the, of the gallery, and of course, droves of people going to see them. And what they've done is hung on either side um, smaller pieces by less uh, popular, less well-known artists who fall into that magic realist category. So you're looking at the magic realists as you're working way up towards Hopper, which is interesting. But there are several people who felt that the connection wasn't a clear one. And I guess what I take issue with is the fact that Hopper certainly would have been aware of magic realism, but it had nothing to do with what he was doing. But anyway, it's totally worth it. Go see the paintings. They're wonderful. They've been recontextualized into this new uh, way of interpreting them. I just don't agree with it. Okay, let's see the next one. Okay, not on view is Woman in the Sun. This is the last uh, image I'll show you. Uh, Woman in the Sun is not on view. Um, and what I really hope is that it should and will debut in the museum as the centerpiece of the Mademoiselle Joe <laughs> exhibition. The Whitney owns this. It's their most important oil. And they have the studies of Joe. So this, this would be mm -hmm. the centerpiece of the Mademoiselle Joe exhibition. And then surrounding this would be all these other images of Joe that, again, we haven't looked at before. And we will start to look at them and study them and explore them and see what they can tell us about, um, about Ed and also about Joe. That's it. <laughs> questions. Can uh, take any questions? Uh, Anyone? Uh, it is so much more to say, but I did it within two minutes. <laughs> so anyone, okay. questions about anything? As I said, I'm sort of sharing a whole lot of new ideas and new ways of, of looking at Hopper and thinking about the work. Oh, this is, this is just the premise of the exhibition. Works on paper, oils, studies, uh, focus on documenting the reclusive artist's most intimate and emotionally charged relationship. This is in the proposal that I've sent out. And, and again, the response was whoever thought about it, but it's true. Because he was someone who wasn't connected to other people. Uh, key to the analysis of the caricatures that he gave to Joe to convey his dissatisfied feelings about the marriage. And again, there are many more, and they're not happy. Um, never intended for exhibition. In fact, when Carter, I should say just as an aside, Carter um, Foster displayed all of Hopper's drawings. Hopper never wanted his drawings displayed. In his lifetime, he rarely allowed the drawings to be shown. Overtures were made about doing a book of the drawings, doing exhibitions of the drawings. He said, the drawings, they're not art. They're just for me. They don't belong in galleries or museums. They don't belong in books. Don't show my drawings. And obviously, the um, French letters were hidden in an attic. I don't think he wanted anyone to know about this secret French girlfriend. The caricatures were never intended for exhibition. But I said to Carter at one point, I don't know which one of us is going to be struck down by a lightning bolt from Hopper first, <laughs> but we're both spending a whole lot of our professional lives showing things that Hopper never wanted seen or shown. But he's gone, so, and we're doing it with goodness and purpose. But um, again, the stuff hasn't been shown. The caricatures haven't really been analyzed or interpreted, certainly not within the context of looking at Joe. And again, the two artist relationship, they painted side by side for 40 years. So you have to look at the paintings that they did together, and you have to take in that part of the story. And then, um, again, this is just other scholars who are going to write about it. It's a rarely seen body of work, looking at it in a new context, that will inform and advance our understanding of the preeminent American realist painter of the 20th century. So when this is done, we'll know a whole lot more about Hopper than we did before. How will we know when that exhibit takes place. I'll tell Stephen. It'll be written in the sky. <coughs> okay. in the sky. Right. I think that'll be appropriate. Yeah. Um, they're they're ruminating. It's it's in it's in the hands of the people who are doing scheduling. And most museums schedule three years out. Okay. So that's pretty much where it is. And I've got nibbles from a couple of places and also publications. And in fact just as a as a random aside, um, I've had many 
publishers show serious interest in the two artists' marriage. The big problem is that all of Joe's work has to be reproduced in color. It hasn't been exhibited, and so you have to reproduce it all in color because it's being seen for the first time, and that's very expensive mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. So the, it, the, the book has made its way up to the sort of highest echelons of several, several publications, several publishers, and then they come back with the numbers, and they're like, art books aren't really mm -hmm. selling for the amount that we have to charge in order to cover the cost of this. So eventually, it'll, it'll all come together eventually. Mm -hmm. But at this point, again, after seeing Madame Cezanne, and walking through the Met and saying the whole premise of this is looking at all the images Cezanne did of his wife and, and helping to understand something more about him that we didn't know before and looking at the intimate relationship and the emotions. I was like, wow, this is a no-brainer. We've got dozens of these images that have never been looked at, and especially in Hopper's case because there weren't other close relationships. And the Picasso Jacqueline, also, if you Google, that was looking at um, the last 20 years, I think, Jacqueline, he was married to the longest. And all his portrayals of her, I mean, the way he portrayed her at different times depending on what was happening in the relationship. So you can't, you can't take, the, um, take the artists out of that context and, and really understand who they were. You have to look at the whole picture. So yes, any questions? Did yes. You paint side by side in the studio? Do you know? Oh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Um, the studio, it's, it's funny, actually. Ed claimed the biggest space with the best light. Now, even the Truro house, the Truro house was built with money from her uncle. That was the inheritance. And he designed the house and got this vast studio. Um, she was painting in the kitchen. By all accounts, she was painting in the kitchen. And she couldn't even get into the kitchen to paint in the kitchen when he was painting because he didn't want her walking through. So that didn't work in terms of real estate. Um, the same thing, the um, studio in New York, he had been there since 1913. He was there his whole life. They married in 1923. Um, she kept her own studio for a couple of years, largely because of the cat. He didn't like the cat, so she kept the studio because the cat lived in the studio. But also she had more room to work there. Then when another studio became available in the building in Washington Square, they took that studio and, and that became her studio. So she did have her own studio. But actually painting side by side, inside, no. He, he would sort of lock the door and not let her in. She would complain about that. He wouldn't talk to her for days when he was working. That's why it's, it's a really interesting point, though, because outside, well, part of it was he wouldn't let her drive. So even her choice of subjects were places he would drive to. Now, in Charleston, um, she could walk to do Pink House. In Charleston, he did some brown building. In Charleston, she went and found <coughs> Pink House, which is an actual location, did these beautiful, but she could walk there. But every place else, they and the Truro House, as you know, is way out in the middle of nowhere. You needed a car to, to be able to get out of there. So the choice of subjects were places that he drove to. And um, then they, they painted stuff. I mean, she'd wander off a little bit, but they definitely painted next to each other outside. But in the studios, no, I don't, I don't think so. But that's a really good question because and it hasn't come up. And the, uh, the, the French girlfriend, mm -hmm. what, at what point was that? Like in oh, that was before they were married. It's, and that was um, the relationship, it's interesting, the relationship broke up around um, the 19, it was 1920. Roughly, the, the, it was a 10 year relationship, roughly 1910 to 1920, 1912 to 22. In fact, the other thing that's interesting, the only, re the only relationships we knew about before he married Joe, uh, there was another woman named um, Enid Size, who um, Hopper was living in a boarding house in France when he was there, and Enid was a student at the Sorbonne and was a fellow student um, in the boarding house. And he did sort of date her. He wrote home and said they'd gone to a party together. And so everyone thought the entire time he was in France, he was completely alone, except for these few references to spending time with Enid. Well, it turns out he wrote home to his mother saying, oh, I was at a Christmas party with Enid, you know, girl from the Sorbonne. So we thought something happened that we don't know. Supposedly, she went back to England. He followed her, said he loved her and wanted to marry her. She was betrothed to someone else, whatever. But some of the letters from this other woman's name was Alta, the other girlfriend who was secret. It's the next day, and <laughs> Alta's like, when are we going to the theater? And this is the day after he had went to the Christmas party. I mean, this is a pretty lively social life for someone who's pretending to be completely by himself. So um, we know he was pursuing Enid, and, and according to the letters, we don't have any of his letters to Alta. 
all we have are all of Alta's letters to him, which are hilarious. I mean, you can get the book now on Amazon for like ten bucks. I would have brought some, but the um, it's uh, but it, it's amazing because her observations about him over this ten year period are just very very interesting. But they also document that she really had the upper hand, and and she's writing and saying, well, why are you complaining? We went out Thursday night. Why do we have to go out Saturday night? I mean, she really was just sort of constantly putting them off. But the big question is why he didn't tell anybody about her. No one knew anything about the relationship. Mm -hmm. It finally ended with her going off and marrying someone else. And apparently it was some kind of scene. He chased her, went after her. Mm -hmm. It just sounded awful. And then she writes to him from her address in Brooklyn where she's now married, and I'm so sorry I hurt you, and all of this. And then the following summer, he started keeping up with Joe. And never told Joe about this. I mean, for the rest of their lives, Joe went on about, oh, he was so alone in Paris. Poor boy, all alone in Paris. <laughs> and he, you know, and this is cover of Time Magazine, 1950, this interview. The, the reporter came up and spent you know, weeks with them and all this information. Oh, he's so alone in Paris. He's all alone in Paris. All alone in Paris. Everything you read, he's alone in Paris. And then all of a sudden, these letters, it's like, really? He was in the opera, he was at the theater, they are the dinner. So it's all just, you know, very interesting. Very interesting. But it helps us to understand. Oh, one other minor premise that came out of this, if you have a chance to look at the book. It's clear in the relationship she is spurning him. He's pursuing her, and he's she's constantly putting him off. That's what the couples start doing. In other words, what's happening in that relationship, <coughs> you kind of line it up with what's happening with the figures and the paintings. There's one where the man has his arm around the woman's waist, and he's kind of pulling her in, and she's like this, you know, looking straight ahead, like totally rigid, not relating to him. And a lot of the kind of body language and how the figures interact is really very similar to what's going on in the in the discourse between between the two of them. So that may be part of what was playing in. We don't know. But it's interesting. Any other questions? Well, yes. Well sort of related, I guess, that uh, I wondered about their social life as a couple. You, you always talk about oh, them Jeff? together, but did they have friends? Did they socialize? I mean, mm -hmm. he wanted to be alone, I, I assume. Yeah, that's a great probably. question, and I should have put in two, two other caricatures. Joe was lively and had lots of friends and had a social life, and Ed basically hated leaving the house. There's something called the wedding guest, and, and Hopper is asleep in the chair, and Joe is leaning him over like this, screaming at him. Screaming, like you see the lines coming out of her mouth, <laughs> screaming. It's the wedding guest, and he's sound asleep, and he's got his hands up like this. And there's another one um, where, again, they're in some kind of social setting, and um, he's sound asleep, curled up in a chair, and she's screaming at him. Now, he, he wanted nothing to do. The only people he socialized with, now, it may have been, again, he was brutally shy. There were some issues there in terms of his personality, very kind of withdrawn and shut down. But um, the only people they socialized with were collectors. In other words, um, Blanchard, B. Blanchard was an early, um, an early collector of his watercolors, and she would invite them to dinner. And, and so when you read all the accounts of every place they went and everything they did and all the people they visited, they were all people who had purchased his work at some point or another. So it's interesting, too, because one, one of my premises, even in terms of the relationships with the women, he had relationships with the people who were there. Joe was there in Gloucester. They, he didn't have to go find her. Enid was in the boarding house. Alta was in his <laughs> painting class. I think he just didn't have this ability to reach out and connect. Guy Dubois was his best friend. Their easels were next to each other. So he kind of didn't go further than who was standing in front of them. And that was true his entire life. You know, Dos Passos, they had the property next door. Yeah. So there was a physical proximity, and those people kind of reached out to him. But beyond that, he didn't didn't pursue many, many close relationships. But the social life, she was constantly wanting to go out and do things. And he just wanted to stay home. So it was, it was interesting. But I think we're finishing up. Yes, anything else? If anyone else has any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I know we need to close up. Yes? Um, this actually is a speculation taking off from, from your mm -hmm. comment about working together in the studio. Because when where their painting practices uh, or their art practices diverge, mm -hmm. it parallels, or in fact, it seems to me the same thing as mm -hmm. their marital relation. Yes. Because when he's doing these working drawings, which I can understand why he never showed, because mm -hmm. they were their purpose was to find out, in his view, what the best yes. representation would yes. be, and that's what he proceeded with. Right. She is not the the um, the painting subject, yes. but she's the object. Yes. In in, in those that's works, exactly uh, right. she's not painting when right. when that's happening. Right. Uh, and her artistic practice doesn't show her mm -hmm. working with models, <coughs> working out different alternatives, and yes. then producing finished 
Yes. Oil painting. She, mm -hmm. in a sense, she stops earlier mm -hmm. with with mm -hmm. watercolors. Yeah. It's yeah. um, a good point. And and that's it, it's very interesting. It's it like is. one is a metonym of, of, exactly. of the other. It, that's why when I, as yeah. I'm proposing this, it's like I I presented it to to Carter and. This is why I want to get a few different Hopper people together to just sort of chew this over. I mean, this is what yeah. scholars do. You know, you have ideas and you put them out there and you see what kind of feedback you get. And up until now, it's been very positive. And it'll probably take three years. I just worked on a Glackens exhibition. I did an essay in the catalog on his still life paintings. But there were five or six different scholars looking at different aspects mm -hmm. of the work that hadn't been looked at before. You have an opportunity to line up all the artwork and then you sort of consider it and, and share new ideas about it. But in his case, there's just so much there. You know, there's so much there that hasn't been looked at, and that's that's what's exciting about it. So, but thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. And if you're interested in this, thank you very much. It's a great time.